Well, I'm very excited uh, this week to catch up with another of our world champions. In fact, he's a two-time ICF world champion in the sport of ocean racing. Uh, he is South African Sean Rice, and he joins us this morning. Sean, great to catch up with you, and uh, you're looking great, mate, after a couple <laughs> of months of lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> I've just come out the cave, but oh, thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. I've been listening to all of your episodes uh, while I paddle on the water, actually. Cool. Well, and well, that leads me to my next question. Have you been able to get on the water? How have you been the last couple of months? Um, yes, paddling wise, back on the water. I'm so grateful. Um, been back on for about five or six weeks now, actually. And uh, just this month, very proud to say that I've uh, accumulated 500 kilometers of, of very fun social paddling with, with my club members. Um, we're allowed to train in a group of six. So so that's about the size of the group I'm training with. So it's, yeah, it's, it's almost feeling, when I'm on the water, things are kind of feeling normal. We should point out, even though you are South African, of course, you've been based in the UK for some time and your local club is here in, in, uh, in, in England, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, I've been living in London for three years um, and I paddle out of Richmond Canoe Club, um, which is just down the road from my house. It's a fantastic club. Um, yeah, it's... it's uh, it's been, a, it's been a blessing um, to come back to a club structure because that's pretty much how I, I learned how to paddle and I learned my sort of trade uh, was in South Africa through a similar club system. Just, we'll, we'll come back to talk about that uh, in just a moment, but um, you were talking about uh, doing the 500 kilometers. Of course, up until this week, your goal would have been the world championships in, in Portugal, but unfortunately we've now heard that uh, they've had to cancel that event. How, how do you feel about that? Yeah, you know what, I, I, to be honest with myself, I, it really shouldn't have been a surprise. Um, you know, I've, I've been quite vocal about um, my sort of thoughts around it. And for them to, to cancel it, it's, it's incredibly sad for, for everyone involved. There's so many people that affects from the organizers to the last year under 18s and 23s and whoever. Um, and for our sports as a whole, it's so sad. But I think um, it's probably, it is the most responsible thing to do and it's not the last time we'll have this race. And I, I sure hope to, to get back to Portugal um, very soon. Um, training wise for me, I, you know, I've been paddling and, and obviously uh, 500 kilometers, it sounds like a lot. It's probably not, it's definitely not as much as I'd normally do, but I was sort of, yes, I was preempting some version of a, an event in, in case the worlds couldn't happen. Um, it's summer in London. It's actually really nice, and I've just been sort of keeping myself mentally and physically fit. Mm. And of course, being a world champion, the defending world champion, would have given this year a little bit something more special for you this year. Ab absolutely. And you know what? I, I sort of thought to myself in the beginning of the year, if I don't, if I don't really give us defending this title a good crack, then I, I'd or I'd always not sort of I'd be upset about it. Um, and then when all these challenges came to us, I still thought, you know what, I can't let this opportunity, it's actually some, some parts of it are there's an opportunity. I said, well, now I'm working from home and living near the water, I should be able to be pretty fit for worlds. But yeah, uh, the cookie crumbles this way. Yeah. Um, I, I actually, yesterday I was speaking to my wife, I was having a little bit of a sulk, which she was like, why are you sulking? This is not a surprise. <laughs> but um, I just suddenly it hit me like a ton of bricks that this, probably means um that there will be no racing in in europe this this year which uh, international racing you know i hope there, there definitely will be domestic racing there have there have been races but you know like large-scale participation events so yeah i don't know I, I i i suppose the reality was you know the paddlers from australia weren't going to be able to come new zealand weren't going to be able to come I don't know what the situation is with your friends in South Africa, but yeah, I don't know. They were not, they were definitely not going to be uh, there. It would have been a fairly, a fairly, I, I, I don't want to use it, but it would have been a weakened world championships, wouldn't yeah. it? It would have been some version of a Euro, European champs. Um, and, and, and you know what, the, I, th I kind of want to separate the two things out. Like I was, you know, I was vocal about the integrity of a world, holding a world championships um, without, you know some of the big players there and everyone has their own understanding of that but i was really meaning like for the title but the actual race itself being i guess the bones of it was the nello summer challenge um course and all that kind of stuff that that i would have loved to see run just domestically um even if it came to that just because there are so many paddlers fantastic paddlers in portugal and spain who could have probably been there um but yeah i, I totally respect and understand their, their decision mm. 
Sean, I, I want to take you back to last year and your win in, in France. Um, I remember talking to you guys straight after you'd come out of the water uh, and it was obvious it was, it was quite an emotional yeah. moment for you. Take us back to that and, and, and what that meant to you winning last year. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I did a, I had a chat to a friend about this um, on a similar podcast recently and um, I, it, it actually meant, it, it meant so much to me and I, and I knew it was going to mean a lot to me. It was different to my first World Champs win, which was a, it was, it wasn't a surprise, but it was everything. I didn't know what it was going to be until it happened and then I was, it was amazing. And coming into the next two World Champs cycles, I, I just, it, things didn't go my way, which is often the, the case. And then in France to have everything lined up and for me to win against, you know, all these fantastic paddlers, I, I really could appreciate how many variables had to fall into place. And then also my preparation, um, it was a stark contrast to what I had been able to do um, before my first Worlds and, and for many years before, you know, moving countries, um, you know, life changes a lot in, in nearly sort of eight years. Um, so, so basically to walk away with that title is a deeply personal um, journey. I fear that if I hadn't won it, what would have happened to me? Because I really invested um, and nothing about it is a sacrifice, but I, I put everything into it. And I'm looking at that picture behind you now. And, you know, I was having a chat with the guys on the water this morning. I was like, I haven't been in that zone for so long. And, and France was probably the deepest I've, I've got into it. And yeah, I, I was completely emotional at the end. And it's, it sounds... It sounds, or might have looked a bit cheesy, but it, it, it was everything to me. When you talk about investing everything into it, what, what do you mean by it? It was just the amount of time you spent training, or you yeah. sacrificed in your private life to get where you were. Yeah, I think um, you know, I'm always, I'm always happy to train hard. I'm, I'm happy to put my body on the line, all that kind of stuff. But the, the, you know, I've come to realize over the years that this is a, is a pretty selfish journey that most of us athletes are on you know, there's a lot of uh, collateral damage around us it'll be loved ones and you know family friends supporters they actually don't <clears throat> excuse me um they don't mind because they do it because they love you or they're part of you they're partners or sponsors etc etc but you feel a deep um, responsibility to that and probably that's where my investment came was i was investing into others i really wanted i wanted everything to work out the way it did um, and when it did, I was just, it was amazing. It was, it was, it was also a kind of a celebration in my head about like everything that I've, I've been through, let it be, um, you know, clubs and, um, you know, people who've invested into me, I know they celebrate with me and, um, yeah, to do that in France, you know, it was just incredible. I, I had a really, I'd been there the year before on that same course, my brother had given me a sweet whooping, um, <laughs> and I'd. I got back to that sort of area a week before Worlds and, and I wasn't entirely confident until that night before the race and I, I, everything settled the day before. It was amazing. And, and while obviously this was your number one focus in the lead up to it, you, you were also grappling behind the scenes with this decision you had to make, uh, whether you continued to race for South Africa. I know at one stage yes. you were talking about, you know, moving over and running racing for, for the UK was, was that a distraction and, and what was your mindset like at the time that was happening Sean? It, it was a distraction you know so so moving to the UK was was done through um, my, my wife's British and we, we had professional sort of uh, reasons to move here for, for work opportunities and other sort of just life journeys and um, anyway being here and um, I guess the responsibilities I had here in terms of work and life, I, I, it was difficult to go back to South Africa to do trials and all these sorts of things. And um, yeah, I, the, the GB, GB canoeing and, and the surf ski guys here and then the kayak guys have been incredibly welcoming and, and they never really proposed it to me. I just thought just from like an, like an admin part, point of view, maybe I should just race for their team or something. It would be easier. And I made, I made an application to do it. And it's quite a formal thing. You're not allowed to, race for your country for a year which all these things were like sort of falling into place and I, I spoke to a number of friends about it and they and I wasn't doing it for monetary reasons I wasn't doing it I was just doing it because I thought it was you know I guess like right and then anyway I went through the whole process and a, pretty much the day of expiry to do this application I emailed everyone I said guys sorry I'm I'm, I'm actually uh, I'm out and and I'd 
I'd spoken to one particular friend and he had said to me, he totally agrees with my decision and whatever. He said, when you stand up on that podium after you've won Worlds this year and you hear God save, God save the Queen or, or in course, he said, Lele, which is the South African um, national anthem, which one are you going to sing? Which one are you, which one's going to make your knees buckle? You know, and I, there wasn't even a question. It was obviously South African. And I thought, you know, what an opportunity to try and win a world champs for South Africa, for myself, for South Africa again and i you know again it kind of goes back to that whole like responsibility thing and i'm so happy for that i'm so so happy and it's really it's just another example of following following your guts and sometimes you just got to go it's nothing the hard way but yeah it, it's i'm very i'm very proudly south african and um, at the same time i i love paddling it with the gb crowd and they're extremely supportive um yeah it's, it's fantastic the, the South African talent pool runs incredibly deep. I mean, it's amazing yeah. the, the number of world-class paddlers that you have in, in, in South Africa. Has it been easier for you being outside of that bubble, do you think? Or, I mean, obviously, you, you miss your brother, I'm sure, and training with your brother and, and Hank and yeah. all those guys. But what's it been like for you being away from that? Yeah, it's funny, like um, in South Africa, I was never like a big deal or something, but like within the, tra you know, I've been there for a long time. So institutionalized, like there's a pecking order and training groups and clubs and all that kind of stuff. And I found myself at the top end of that. And, you know, even in racing, like locally, there were tactics. And then I moved to the UK. I don't think majority of the guys and really cared who I was <laughs> or knew who I was. Um, and I got sort of knee deep into some good racing and I, sort of gave my gave my best and um yeah it's 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 kind of funny like um there's such such strong systems here in place like the club systems are so much more formal than what you would have in most parts of south africa even though yes they are like very very strong training groups in, in south africa they they're almost more social based um where here you've got like a coach for the juniors a coach for the under 23s a coach for the seniors no one intermingles no one boys versus girls it's like it's weird to me, it's not, it's not weird, it's strange. I don't understand it because in South Africa, it's a melting pot. Yep, Basically, yep. as a junior, you're thrown on the outskirts of the senior group and you're told to survive. And if you don't survive, well, they look after you, but you know what I mean? We're here, everything's, so I could almost slip between the cracks here. I just joined in groups that I wanted to. Um, it's been fantastic. I, I have uh, I'm a bit of like a renegade, I guess. <laughs> so it's a, a little bit less pressure. Absolutely no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is it about South Africa, uh, Sean, and, and the production line there of fantastic paddlers? I mean, it is obviously very similar to Australia. You have wonderful ocean training areas there. You have, have great facilities and that sort of stuff. But is there a culture there that, that, that you wouldn't notice, you wouldn't see in other parts of the world? Um, it's a good question. Um, there's no, I don't think there's a simple answer for that. But, but from my experience as a young person, coming like and, and it's sort of, sort of like young person up i looked at the the group of paddlers that were at my local club and i looked at a few key people there and i went wow those people are really impressive they're really cool mm. um so it started off as like a bit of a uh, you know these were ambassadors to me in various ways you know let it be that they they were down at the beach uh, or you know like they looked cool or they, what they could do was nice or they were in in later parts of the this journey i saw the likes of david mark and hank traveling overseas to do races and actually making prize money i'm going wow i'd love to do that what's the way to do that train your hard <laughs> um and 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 then what you how do you i how do i win that race well i have to beat hank and david and the nice part was that they lived in the same country as me so if i couldn't beat them at a time trial on a wednesday i wasn't going to beat them internationally so i didn't have to wait for the international races to to give them a go or for them to beat me or I, there was no wandering by the time i got to an international race i knew i could at least beat some of the kingpins there, which probably meant I could win the race. Mm. Um, so, so, and then, yeah, I, I guess the, the so, there's a big social side to it. Um, there, here they have a, a number of all stars. Um, I can't really speak too much about the system because I haven't been embedded in it enough. Um, there's obviously pros and cons to both sides. Um, I, I, I suspect, and just looking from the outside in again. I've, what I'm seeing in the world in terms of growth, I see like the likes of Spain and Portugal aligning quite closely to what we would have had in South Africa and, and Australia from what I know in Australia. And I 
I wouldn't be surprised if there's a European world champion surf ski or ocean racing um, within the next two to three cycles. Mm. I, I really wouldn't surprise me um, one bit. It's just incredible the, 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 the grassroots like movement that's happening there. Yeah. You mentioned there about prize money, Sean. For those listening, can you make enough money in this sport to just concentrate on the sport or do you have to have a job? Um, I think you can. It's not the old, it's not the old, you know, things have changed in the last 10 years. You, you're definitely not going to be making money from a salary, but, but there are plenty of paddlers who have proven themselves to be brands. Um, you know, there's people who've got incredible followings online. Um, you can leverage, basically you use your profile in sport to leverage. And, um, I don't know if you, you make money directly from like the paddle strokes you do, but, but being able to prove yourself on an international stage or a local stage or whatever makes you relatable to people. And, and I know from my experience outside of, you know, in business outside of paddling, having a point of conversation with, with a client or something like, wow, you, you went there for that race or, or you participated. That's just like this. People understand athletes and what makes an athlete tick. And if you can be a really good athlete or a good athlete, people are going to understand your values um, and, and sort of respect them. So, and then, you know, there are some paddlers, including myself, who've made a, a passion and a business and a career out of paddling, let it be through racing, there's prize money, and then there's coaching. I do a lot of coaching. I've, I've got an online business and, and a coaching workshop business. Um, you know, I've, I've sold apparel, I've done all these things. Um, you, you just simply can't rely on one. Mm, yeah. Uh, and Sean, you have dabbled in the past in um, canoe sprint. You've also done uh, marathon as well. Is ocean racing your passion? Is that where you see the rest of your career? Or do you still harbour somewhere deep inside a, an Olympic dream or, or something like that? Um, I have a deep passion for kayak, marathon and, and a little bit for sprint. Um, I love it. It's where, where I was actually, where I started paddling was on a K1. Um, Olympic wise, I, so maybe, so, so I always, I really wanted to go to the Olympics. It was like one of my dreams. I, I, it, this whole professional paddling thing wasn't a dream, you know, it was like, wow, the Olympics would be great. But I started doing a bit of marathons and then sprints with a, a chap named Sean Rubenstein, Olympian and, and world champion himself. And I really respected what, what it took because I knew through him telling me like what the work we're going to do. And we did try um for 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 the sprinting side of things and then i went to a world sprint champs in 2016 or 2017 Chichi, in, yeah. in richissi yeah. and it was it was a, the most amazing experience because i went there finally made like a world stage and sprints and i was just like a kid in a candy shop like actually being able to see the uh the level of paddling that these you know men and women are at this was just incredible I would love to have been able to or to perform at that stage now, but I really, from that trip, I walked away going, it's probably best I just have a, you know, a really fun uh, relationship and, and career in marathon and sprints. Um, but, but, but surf ski is really where my, like surf ski, when I go to a big race or small race, like it gets me buzzing. I, I enjoy everything about it. Um, yeah. Uh, you have to give it all for surf ski and you probably have to, you do definitely have to give it all for, for, for Olympics. You can't do both. Yeah. I mean, look, on, on paper, you would think that South Africa would be able to put together a fairly decent men's K4 with yeah. you and, and Kenny and Andy and, and, and even Hank, even though Hank's now sort of getting towards the end of his career, but there's plenty of others there as well, isn't there? That, yeah. That you said and others that could, that could come together. Yeah, we will, you know, South Africa will um, provide that, like we will provide a stock of paddlers for sprinting forever. It's deeply ingrained in our culture as a paddling nation. Um, the reason why we haven't had more world champions in that, I, I don't know what the simple answer is to that, but I can tell you the reason why, one of the reasons why we're such good paddlers in general is that we're dynamic because we never ever just doing one thing. Yes. You know, in terms of a, a racing season, we have, it splits up into rivers, marathon, sprint, ocean, and then you split it into doubles and individual seasons. So you paddle a K1 for this part of the season and then a K2. So you're talking like eight different sections of each year. And that's why you have people who could seemingly so easily cross over, but to get them out of that sort of cycle and fun, um, 
yeah, it's very difficult. And and who as a, as like my experience with the sprinting, I'm like I'm doing all this hard work, and then you know there's variables in surf ski. There's so many variables in surf ski and ocean racing, but I would almost argue there's more uncontrollable variables in sprint kayaking because you can, if you think for a thousand meter course with X time and these qualification spots, how simple it should be, it's just not because there's so many people vying for those few spots. And there's obviously politics and, and all sorts of other things involved, which I have no time for. Did you find that? Did you put some politics? Yeah, li likely. Like I actually had a very positive um, experience with 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 both marathons. When everyone was very deeply supportive, especially in South Africa. Mm -hmm. But I've I've I'm you know I've I've heard it all and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, yeah. you know, there's politics in ocean racing, but then at the same time, the you know, it's kind of more of an individual sport in a way. Like you 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 have federations involved in that, but we don't have the limitations by any means um, that are imposed in terms of how many people can enter and all that kind of stuff. And it's been a deep debate within our sport of ocean racing, if that should be instated, um, but that's for another day. Yeah, and, I, and another discussion that has happened is, is whether ocean racing would be a good fit on the Olympic program itself. Uh, yeah. And when you look at where uh, in, you know, in, in Los Angeles in, in 2028, you couldn't think of a, a better location, could you, to have ocean racing yeah. on the California coast? And uh, I know America don't have a lot of very strong ocean racing paddlers at the moment, but what a great opportunity to sell the sport to uh, a country where they do enjoy a lot of water sport. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe, maybe one day um, I've seen, um, you know, I don't know much about it, but I've seen the experience that sort of SUP SUP has had with that whole journey. Um, our sports, you know, people sometimes say it should be much bigger or whatever, whatever, but it's kind of just in this very organic, natural space where it's, it's almost still 50-50 lifestyle to racing. Where, where when, I think when you go down the Olympic path, you're forced to go the professional side of it really takes front and center stage. And I don't know, you know, the, the development of that sport then becomes like, how do we do it? How do we do it? Where Sersky is just ticking along quite fine by itself. There's the racing series stuff, um, the profiles in the sports in terms of athletes. Um, I would still love to see it far, far, far bigger. Um, but I don't think we're like, we're almost like an immature teenager who's like not <laughs> ready to get a real job. And they could probably sit there in their suits but they're going, to, they're going to run a mark and cause trouble at some point. And we kind of need this kid to decide what he wants to do, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's a really good analogy, actually. So, yeah. I can, so relate really, a lot, I can relate a lot to our sport in many ways. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're quite happy for it to stay where it is. You, you don't think the Olympics should be the goal of the sport? or I, I don't think the Olympics should be the goal, but I do think what, what ICF is bringing in ways is what we need and that is like a real um someone or some a, some version of organization maybe icf where it needs to really think about 10 years mm -hmm. um there's there's a lot of development in Sersky, but it's it's sporadic and i wish we could actually celebrate the likes of what's happening in the canary islands and and all over spain and and what's happening recently in germany and the, all these developments and how do we support those small areas to actually springboard um, at the moment they're on their, their own and, and um, an organization like ICF, I guess, could, could provide that professional backing. Yeah. Um, so so there, are two, there are two really sort of big camps, one against, one for. Yeah. Um, I'm, you know, I've, I've got different perspectives on the sport because I'm an athlete, but I'm also professionally involved like in terms of business. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's space for both. I don't, I think people can vote with their feet or their paddles <laughs> yes, yes. and they can participate or they or they don't have to um but i still think there's there's space and um yeah maybe i'm maybe i'm too optimistic but i think there's there's some version of peace that can be can be made yeah for sure uh, and sean the future for you what what do you are you the sort of person who maps out a long-term plan do you do you have goals that you still want to achieve what what, what does it mean for you the future um, yeah, I'm, I will paddle, paddle till the day I can't. Um, I will definitely be racing for as long as I can. And I think I rely on that, you know, I rely on that structure of, of my life, you know, the, the whole journey, the training, the, the goal setting, the evaluation of success and failure and what all that, that kind of stuff. 
Um, you know, I am having to become a bit more strategic with what I do though. So I've learned over the years what, what my limitations are in terms of travel and, and racing and all that kind of stuff. I, I have been for about 10 years the man who says yes. You know, I, I was traveling to as many as, uh, I mean, 2017, I think I did 22 countries in a year. Um, you know, many, and that was a racing or coaching or whatever. It was, I think for a period of two years, I spent the longest time I spent in one, era, one place was three weeks. Yeah. Um, so sort of scaling back from that won't be difficult. Um, I don't know what will actually happen to our sport in terms of racing coming out the back of, of 2020 with COVID and everything. I, I sure hope that the sort of the commercial partners and the, the organizations that are racing sort of uh, events teams and that can hold it together for another season. Um, it might strip away the fat of a few big races. Um, but then what I'm seeing now is, so for instance, I, uh, not this weekend, but the following weekend, I'm going down to Cornwall. We're allowed to travel now responsibly within the UK. And I'm going down to Cornwall and I meet up with a bunch of the um, GB Ocean Racing team members. And we're going to do like a training day. Yeah. And, um, you know, something like a race might spurt out the back of that for, for, for the end of summer or something. Um, so really, sort of for me right now, it's about looking after my home. Um, so looking after Sersky, what's happening here, coaching. It really involving myself deeper than what I would normally have had time for. Um, and hopefully all the countries can do that. And, and when we come out the back of this, you know, yeah, I, I would love to just, I would, everyone would love to go back to normal, but I guess there will be some changes. Yeah, I think a common thread, Sean, through the conversations I've had with so many athletes in, in recent weeks is that while there've been a lot of negatives about the last few months, one of the positives is that it's allowed us to focus on areas that we've maybe neglected yeah past just because of a lack of time a lack of resources and all of a sudden we've been able to focus on those sorts of things yeah and i think you know in terms of athletes out there i i for one i've struggled with with uh not motivation but like what is next i've been my life has been in a cycle of of races and events um for 10 years 12 years so so it's been a huge disruption for me and i've i've had to take sort of um a step back and have a, a reevaluate like what is paddling to me and and for me it's uh, everything i've mentioned before but uh you know just just paddle today and then when it's tomorrow paddle again tomorrow don't stop just keep moving um your competitiveness uh, you know your your competition you will be able to compete again um you know don't be silly and and just throw in towels or anything just try to keep have you had days sean have you had days when you have thought you're going to give it all away or walk away? um no honestly i haven't um there was when we first went into lockdown i went about a week without paddling a week and a half um and i and then went for a paddle um for whatever reason i came back and i said to my wife i was like wow I, that was awesome i loved that there was nothing special about it but i just loved that i loved the feeling that euphoric feeling i had afterwards even though i'd only paddled eight kilometers in the river um and I just realized I actually, I need that. And that's funny because I normally take about a break of six to eight weeks every year. I actually take that much time off. So for me to go from zero to zero in a week and a half, I was actually like, pull myself, you know, pull yourself together, Sean. The world's not, the world's not ending. <laughs> no, it does feel like it sometimes, but yeah. It so does, it does. Yeah. Well, it's been great uh, catching up with you, Sean. And, and we are, you know, we're all disappointed that we're not going to get a world championships this year. And, and it would have been a fantastic location. We all know how great it is oh, there in Portugal. And, uh, but we have got next year's to look forward to. So we keep our fingers crossed that, that, that everything will be back to normal next year and that you are back paddling as strong and as healthy as ever. Good to catch up with you, Sean. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, thanks for that picture. It's really got me thinking, yes. when am I going to I need to get back into that zone. I need to cut my hair. <laughs> do, you, do you always paddle with your, your tongue out, or is that just something when you? I really... think I think I think that's the yeah that's the that's the stair right there, the one that I'm even I'm scared of. Um, yeah. So yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not the prettiest paddler. <laughs> yeah, paddling, well, doesn't really matter how you get there, as long as you get there. Yeah, yeah. All right, good to catch up with you, Sean. Yeah, chat soon. Bye.